Hello and welcome to the History of Vikings. Today I'm joined by Dr. Jackson Crawford, and uh, this man really needs no introduction, but he is an Old Norse specialist and translator teaching at the University of Colorado Boulder, formerly UC Berkeley and UCLA. As many of you know, he runs an awesome YouTube channel with almost 60,000 subscribers passionately making videos. And uh, I know many of you are extremely familiar with his YouTube channel. I know I am. Uh, and of course, you can find anything under the sun in terms of Norse Smith or Old Norse. So I will definitely put a link to his YouTube channel in the description of the show. He has also uh, written a translation of the Poetic Edda as well as the Saga of the Volsungs, which I highly recommend. In fact, I just ordered my copy of the Poetic Edda this morning. So you'll find, of course, links to both of those in the description of the show. But Dr. Jackson Crawford, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for your friendly welcome. It's my pleasure. So I guess my first question to you, Dr. Crawford, would be, you know, we've talked about the Norse myths quite extensively on my show. We've talked about the Vikings quite extensively, uh, but we haven't really touched on Old Norse, which I know you, of course, are a specialist in. Uh, so could you just sort of tell us, you know, what was Old Norse? Was it the the language of the Vikings? Did they communicate to one another in Old Norse? Uh, is there any correlation between the rune stones and Old Norse? Okay, well, this is a pretty big question. Try to uh, introduce a language. Uh, I'll do what I can. So uh, Old Norse is a, like any designation for a language, there are sort of arbitrary boundaries to what we're going to call, uh, to what we're going to put under the label. So even with English today, uh, think about uh, some of the cases on the edge um, people disagree, for instance, about whether certain Scottish dialects are quote-unquote English uh, because they might not be mutually intelligible with other uh, dialects, but uh, they have a recognizable common ancestor with other dialects of English. Uh, still, most linguists, myself included, uh, would call a lot of dialects in Scotland Scots rather than English. So there's a, there's a boundary sometimes in the dialects of a given time, but also there are boundaries... Uh, between different times. So, for example, uh, when I show someone a quotation from, say, Beowulf, you know, if they haven't taken Old English in school, they're unlikely to call that English. So, you know, we have to kind of put somewhat arbitrary lines of place and time on the language. And typically, uh, the arbitrary lines that we would put on Old Norse would be starting around 700-ish. Uh, we see certain changes happening in uh, the language of Scandinavia around that time that mark off archaic Old Norse from what we can call late Proto-Norse. And then on the other end, around the Black Death and about 1380 in Scandinavia. After the Black Death, we also see uh, massive changes in language, which lead to the Middle Scandinavian period, uh, what we can call maybe very early modern Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, etc., as opposed to Old Norse. And then uh, as far as geographical boundaries, this would have been the native spoken language of uh, most people living in uh, Denmark and Norway and Sweden, with the exception of the Sami-speaking population in Norway and Sweden uh, during the time period I just outlined, and then in Iceland starting in the late 800s when it was settled from Norway, and then in uh, colonies or settlements of Scandinavians in, say, England, France, and uh, Greenland, etc. So the language is Germanic. It is. Uh, it has a recent-ish common ancestor with other Germanic languages of its time, such as Old English uh, and Old Saxon and Northern Germany, Old High German, and was probably fairly mutually intelligible with those languages still. And in writing, uh, we find uh, that the earliest written evidence of the language is in runes. Uh, its ancestor stage. Uh, what I usually call Proto-Norse, sometimes people call it Proto-Scandinavian, it means the same thing, is written in the Elder Futhark of 24 runes, but the uh, true Old Norse language of the Viking Age and then the Sagas and Eddas is written in the Younger Futhark of 16 letters. And then beginning around 1150 AD, we start to find manuscripts written in the Roman alphabet. Probably Christian missionaries had begun writing these languages in the Roman alphabet a little bit earlier, but that's when the first uh, physical manuscripts we can date uh, come from. So it is a language written in two different alphabets. The spoken language itself doesn't differ depending on which alphabet it's written in. Uh, sort of 
sort of like we can take Russian words, you know, I can take the name Vladimir Putin or something, and I can write that in the Roman alphabet, right? I can write V-L-A-D-I-M-I-R instead of the, the Russian, the Cyrillic alphabet. Um, it doesn't change what the spoken language is. And so similarly, Old Norse is in a different language if it's written in runes versus if it's written in the Roman alphabet, which I find is a little bit of a common misunderstanding. Sometimes people think that if it's written in runes, it's a little more authentic. But in fact, the vast majority of our literature is in the Roman alphabet. Fascinating. And you mentioned that at the time, Old Norse would have been sort of more mutually uh, intelligible to that of Old English in those other languages. So does that mean that when the Vikings invaded England, the Anglo-Saxons would have had an, an easier time understanding or even communicating uh, with the Vikings than, than we might think today? Yes, I think so. Sometimes it's presented as if there would be perfect mutual intelligibility. I think that's a little inaccurate. Um, you know, these languages have been isolated from each other for a couple hundred years by the time that the Vikings were invading England. Um, but I would say it's comparable to the situation between speakers of geographically reasonably close Romance languages today. Um, you know, a Spanish speaker and an Italian speaker, they certainly recognize that their languages are related. But an Italian speaker can definitely say things in Italian that wouldn't be fully understandable to a Spanish speaker who hadn't you know, been exposed to Italian for a while. And I think that's a similar situation with Old Norse and Old English. Initially, a speaker who hasn't encountered the other is probably not going to understand everything. But after a while, you start to kind of understand what the, the substitutions are. Uh, so for example, when we imitate different accents in English, typically we um, will we'll imitate some particular sound that we know always replaces another sound in our own accent. So when people imitate Southerners, uh, they will say instead of, you know, night and time and ride, they'll say night and time and ride, replacing consistently the I sound with the monophthong ah sound. And so language does develop in a predictable way. You can kind of say, oh, so where my accent has this sound, that accent has this sound. And with Old Norse and Old English, you could do something very similar once you sort of get exposed to it enough to understand what those substitutions are. Um, a really good example is uh, wherever you see the diphthong A, spelled E-I in Old Norse, you're going to have a long A in Old English, and that's extremely consistent. So Old Norse hamer is Old English ham, home. Old Norse stein, stone is Old Norse stan, uh, etc., etc. And that just runs through the whole system. And of course, you can still do this with modern English in Old Norse, where there's an E-I in Old Norse, is going to be a long O in modern English now, which comes from that long A in Old English. And so I think speakers you know, without necessarily even being conscious of what they're doing, start picking up on those substitutions and saying, oh, you know, when he says hammer, he means the same thing I mean when I say hom. And before long, it gets a little bit easier to understand each other. When I'm teaching this, I usually use, um, when, when I'm, especially teaching, teaching, say, a Vikings class, and I want to try to convey some sense of the mutual intelligibility, I'll sometimes pull out a couple sentences. Um, and one of my favorites is, I'm going to burn your house because I think that's perhaps realistic Viking Anglo-Saxon dialogue. And so I'll take a couple students and I'll give them the Old Norse form, which is ek vil brenna thit hus. And then I'll take a few other students and I'll give them the Old English, ich vil a biarnon uh, thin hus. And I tell them, you know, the other side is going to say this to you. and But I'll, the other side will actually say it in the other language. But they'll still recognize it as being the same utterance. The same roots are there. Uh, there's certain sound substitutions, and I'm being a little bit artificial here. I mean, I'm making up a sentence that is pretty easy to convert. Um, you know, there's differences in style. There's differences a little bit in word order and things like that. But it's really not, it's not terribly difficult. And it's interesting to see that in writing in Old Norse in the 1100s, 1200s, when they're starting to write their own uh, literature, there are at least two documents in Old Norse that talk about when English was the same language as ours. Wow. So uh, in the first grammatical treatise written in 1140, there is an unknown Icelandic scholar who was talking about uh, his ideas for how to improve the uh, spelling of Old Norse using the Roman alphabet. And he said, we should follow something like, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, quoting from memory, but something like, we should follow the English example because they speak the same language as us, even if... Uh, both of our languages have changed a little, or one of them has changed a lot, which is a really sophisticated understanding of it, actually. Um, and then in one saga, 
uh, Gunlaug Saga Ormstung, the saga of Gunlaug Ormtung, he uh, is visiting England and he becomes a court poet for the English king. And the author feels it necessary to pause for a moment, you know, maybe expecting his audience in the 1200s or so in Iceland to think this is a little unusual. Uh, you know, why would an English king care about Norse poetry? And he says, at this time, and he's talking about the Viking Age, the language in England was the same as it is in Scandinavia. Uh, which is, I mean, not exactly true, but it reflects the fact that they did kind of remember that there was a time when it was easy to talk to the English. To this day, as a side note to that, the Scandinavian languages are probably the easiest languages to learn for an English speaker. The grammar is similar. Um, the vocabulary is similar. Um, all the assumptions that we make when we learn something like Spanish that make us sound like terrible Spanish speakers are assumptions that are, you know, that easily carry over to Scandinavian, like adding an S to make something possessive, for example. Um, and I think that's also a big part of why Scandinavians tend to speak English so well, is they're already barely learning a foreign language. It's just a forgotten sister of their own language, as I like to say. Oh, that's fascinating. That's really, really an interesting way to um, just understand how, uh, you know, the Vikings would have communicated with other people. But but moving on from Old Norse, you know, we talked about the the language of the Vikings, which I know a lot of people will be uh, delighted when they listen to this interview, because I've had many requests to get into some Old Norse. But moving on from Old Norse and perhaps getting into the mythology a little bit. You know, um, we've talked about, as I said before, Norse mythology um, sort of extensively on this show. We had Professor Caroline Larrington on, and uh, she was nice enough to give us an introduction to sort of the sources that we have for Old Norse, the uh, Poetic Edda, which you have a brilliant translation of, uh, as well as the Prose Edda. Now, my question is, in regards to the Prose Edda, we, we know that that was, that was written by um, uh, a man by the name of uh, Snorri Sturluson, and he, of course, was a Christian. And, you know, how are the Poetic Edda in, in the Prose Edda different? You know, um, what are their similarities? What are their differences? Uh, because one has the influence of a medieval Christian, does that make it unreliable? How, how do they relate to one another or uh, not relate at all? That's a good question, uh, what the difference is between the poetic and prose edda. And I think a lot of people getting into Norse mythology don't don't pose that question to themselves and seek out the answer, because it's a, it actually has a big influence on how we think about um, this material. So the prose edda is the one that actually was named edda first. Uh, we find copies uh, in manuscripts of this uh, document, I'll say, in uh, medieval and early modern manuscripts uh, where the title Edda is given to it. And based on some hints about his life, we infer that it is the work of Snorri Sturluson, although it is not signed, right? Medieval writers um, didn't sign their work the way that we do today. Uh, so it's, it's probably 99% certain that it's Snorri Sturluson's work, although there is a small chance that it's actually not. Um, but we can assume it is. And basically that work, which he just called Edda, calling it the Prose Edda or the Younger Edda is, well, it's called Edda. We assume it's his title, um, but it could also not have been given by him. But it's the original work just called Edda. We, we call it the Prose Edda or the Younger Edda to distinguish it from what we call the Poetic Edda, but I'll get to that in a moment. So that work originally uh, was written uh, by Snorri in the 1220s, and it's if you know the three sections of the Prose Edda, there's uh, Gilvaginning, uh, which is mostly just stories about the gods. Then there's Skoldskaparmol, uh, the art of poetry, which is uh, mostly kinnings and also um, more myths that explain a lot of those kinnings. And then the third part is called Hotatal, list of meters, and that's uh, different poems demonstrating different poetic meters in Old Norse. The usual scholarly understanding is that it's actually written backwards in those three sections. So Hotetal is the first part. Snorri is composing, um, and we are certain that Hotetal is written by Snorri for sure. Uh, Snorri is composing a uh, praise poem, and in each different stanza, he is using a different Old Norse meter. And apparently part of the motivation for doing this uh, was that uh, the traditional forms of Norse poetry, Edic and Skaldic, were becoming less popular in his time. Uh, so in the 1200s, Iceland is getting a little bit more politically incorporated with Norway. 
uh, a few decades after Snorri's death, um, Iceland would actually be unified with Norway in one political state. And at the same time, it's also becoming culturally more subject to influence from the outer world. And so uh, the courtly romances about the Arthurian knights and all that kind of stuff that starts becoming popular in England and France also reaches the Norse world, including Iceland. And so the, the not just the content, but the poetic style of that stuff is what's becoming popular. And Snorri seems to be sort of fighting a, um, an art lover's reaction against this new stuff coming in and, and is demonstrating, you know, the versatility, the power of this old, this old Norse poetic style. But in order to teach people how to compose it, he needs not only to show the meters, he also needs to explain all these kinnings, right? These weird ways of talking about things. Why is it that gold can be called the ransom for the otter, right? Why is it that, um, that Thor might be referred to as Slayer of Hrungnir or something like that? So in Skoldskapramol, the middle section, which is probably written second, he sets out to explain all these kinnings, and in the process, he tells several myths. And so Skoldskapramol, that part of the prose edda, is our main source for a lot of popular stories of Norse myth, like uh, like how Odin got the meat of poetry, or how Thor killed uh, the giants Hrungnir and Gerðr, or how uh, Loki uh, lost Ilun the the goddess who keeps the apples of, of eternal youth to the giants and then got her back. But after writing this part, it is still not a basic explanation of who these gods are and what the basic facts and stories about them are. And so Gil beginning the first part of the prose that seems to have been written last, um, as basically just Snorri taking everything he knows and trying to write it down in as cohesive a form as he can. So he's a medieval Christian. And of course, uh, Christianity has a well-developed canon, right, of texts, uh, the, the Bible, and then, of course, depending on denomination, various other things that are considered uh, canonical understandings or canonical texts. Snorri is approaching the beliefs of his forefathers as if it has that kind of canon. And I think that is actually the main... People complain about the Christian influence on Snorri without understanding what I think is the main Christian influence on Snorri, which is that he wants it to be coherent, right? He wants everything to agree with everything else. He wants, if one God is, is said to be the father of, of God B in this text, but he's not the father of God B in another text, somebody else is, he has to figure that out and see which one is quote unquote right. Even though those two different fathers probably reflect two different traditions, two different times, you know, just natural variation that arises in mythological uh, literature. So he takes these stories, tries to present them in a coherent way. And, uh, you know, thanks to him, we have a lot of stories that we would never otherwise have had. Um, a lot of the stories in the prose that fill in gaps um, that come from, that, that are in poems that we know are very old, uh, but just that never explain the story they're telling. So Snorri will tell the story that is just hinted at in some poem that's very old. And so uh, he helps us understand the context, helps us actually understand a lot of these hints that we otherwise would be totally lost about. Uh, at the same time, he does probably smooth things over too much. Uh, and I think sometimes he's probably a little bit mistaken. Um, for example, he says that on top of the, uh, the tree Yggdrasil, there is an eagle and that a hawk sits on top of the eagle's face. But if you read the old poems, they only ever mention one bird of prey on top. So probably what's going on is he's got one poem where that bird of prey is called a hawk because hawk alliterates with some other word in the poem, right? Norse poetry is alliterative, uh, you know, the 10 terrible Tyrannosaurus thing. So he has something like, you know, the hawk hovers over the high tree. Uh, I'm just using English examples to kind of show him what I'm talking about. But then in another poem, that bird of prey is called an eagle because it alliterates with vowels, right? The eagle elevates over the elm or something. And he's not content that it's just some bird of prey. He has to have this make sense. Oh, well, here it says it's a hawk. Here it says it's an eagle. So he makes it a hawk sitting on top of an eagle's face. I think, I think that's the kind of thing where Snorri is a little bit, uh, a little bit off. But so in his prose edda, he's often quoting poetry either very directly uh, an entire stanzas 
or entire chunks of poems. He quotes about a third of Volospa, for example. And then um, often also in the prose that he writes, he quotes language that alliterates in such a way that it's clearly drawn from a poem. Uh, the most famous example of that is from The Death of Baldur, where he doesn't quote much poetry, but in the uh, story of uh, Frigg talking to Loki about what Baldur's uh, weakness is, she says, Vex vidar tamen gor ein fyrir vest on Valhol. A certain shoot of a tree grows west of uh, Valhol. And the, all the Vs uh, show that this probably is drawn from a poem about the death of Baldur that we've lost. And so many of the poems that he quotes are preserved in the Poetic Edda. Some of them are not. They are just quotes from otherwise lost poems. So hopefully that conveys what the prose that is. <laughs> no, that was a very thorough answer, which is great. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there something in the prose Edda or just something of um, Snorri Sturluson likening the gods? And I could be totally wrong, but was it likening the gods Thor, Odin, and Loki to being descendants of the ancient city of Troy or something like that? Yeah, and that's so that's not any of the three sections I was just talking about. Oh, that's okay. the prologue. And the short prologue is probably the very last part that's written. And so in that prologue, it's interesting. I mean, he 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 starts off by saying, God created the world in seven days. He gives a very conventional Christian Genesis story uh, in brief. But then he says that in some parts of the world, uh, people forgot the name of God. And they naturally knew that someone had made them, someone had made the world. And so they uh, created gods to uh, to tell stories about and worship. It's actually a very, very tolerant attitude toward other religions for a medieval writer. And then he goes on to say that, you know, in our part of the world, the people that were mistakenly held to be gods were the Trojans who escaped the burning of Troy, which is, you know, <laughs> tendentious. Yeah. It's not correct. Uh, but what that springs from is actually a very common medieval tradition as uh, Greek and Roman literature was beginning to spread again and become popular, especially among learned circles. Everybody sort of started writing Trojan fanfic, right? What happens to the Trojans? Who are the Trojans? We know who the Greeks are, but who are the Trojans? And so lots of different countries had their explanation, you know, we are the Trojans. So there's a, there's a British version of this too where it's the British who are the Trojans. There's an Albanian version of this where the Albanians are, are the Trojans. So Snorri is just participating in a common intellectual game of the Middle Ages where he's saying, oh, it's our ancestors who are the Trojans. And he's noticing some, um, some you know, pretty incorrect <laughs> similar names there. Like he says, Hector, that's Thor. Uh, the Sibyl, that's Siv, his wife. None of this has any scholarly value um, you know, for us studying the actual history of this religion, it's just sort of a fossil of his time. Um, and there's no, there's no real connection between the Trojans and the Norse gods. It's just a, it's a figment of Snorri's, Snorri's time. Um, you know, I, I guess I look at it as being an artifact of when Snorri wrote this book, just like, you know, if you were watching an otherwise good movie that betrays it was made in 1978 because there's disco in it or something. Uh, it's, it's really, it's just part of Snorri's gotcha, time. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that really, really answers, I think, it, an important question in, in sort of the relation to the, the credibility of the Prosetta. But question that I'll ask you is, if I remember correctly, I believe you said in some of your videos, and I've uh, really realized this as I've, uh, you know, read the Norse myths, is when we look at the the basic characters in Norse myth, right? The gods, uh, we see a lot of them having attributes and traits that sort of overlap with one another. Like uh, we see this trait of war in Thor, but we also see that in the gods Tyr and Odin, or we might see the the attribute of fertility in, you know, Freyr, uh, as well as the um, sort of seafaring god Njord, right? So when we look at the Norse gods, can we say that, would it be fair to say that one god is indeed the god of something, the god of war, the god of um, agriculture, the god of the sea, the god of fertility, or is there a lot of overlapping traits that the gods have in, in how we understand Norse myth? That's a really good question. Uh, let me ask you first. So I said what the prosody is. Do I have time to go and 
talk about the poetic edit too, because you asked the difference between the prose and the poetic. Oh yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. So, all right. So that's, so I explained what the prose edit is. So the poetic edit is very different in its composition and its contents. It is rather than the work of one person and his understanding of these myths, uh, I liken the poetic edit to a mixtape or to an iTunes playlist on shuffle. So somebody in um, roughly 1270 just wrote down the poems about the Norse gods and heroes that he knew. Uh, actually, the, the manuscript we have, which is from about 1270, is copied from a manuscript in about 1200. But um, we know that there's still some decision being made by the copier in 1270 because he adds Hovamol, which we can tell from the way it's spelled comes from a different manuscript than the other poems. Fun random fact. But, uh, but, but basically, it's a, it's a mixtape. Someone or two persons came up with uh, just, you know, what poems do we know, what poems do we remember, and wrote them all down in sort of a logical order. I mean, we start with Boleswa, the creation and destruction of the world. Then we get some poems about Odin's, some poems, a poem about Freyr, some poems about Thor. And then we transition um, through an elf and dwarf section <laughs> to poems about human heroes. And these poems are not related to each other. They are probably composed in many different centuries and many different places. And so they contradict one another because they come from different traditions of uh, Norse belief. I mean, if you think about drawing a comparison to Christianity again, that is a religion that has an established canon. And yet consider how different, say, Greek Orthodox is from Southern Baptist. All right, so... What I think you've got in the Poetic Edda is, so to speak, some Southern Baptist poems and some Greek Orthodox poems, and some of those come from uh, as early as the 800s, and some of them come from as late as the 1100s, and then some of them are going to come, some of them we can pretty confidently say were probably originally composed in Norway, uh, some probably originally in Iceland, at least one actually originally in Greenland. Uh, so you've got geographical differences, you've got time differences, and you've probably got differences of tradition, uh, either conscious or, or subconscious. But they're all thrown together. So like I said, it's a little bit like a mix, like a mixtape, or like if I go to my iTunes and I put it on shuffle, and I take the, just the, whatever the first 30 songs are, and I put those all in one CD. I'm going to get some Merle Haggard, I'm going to get some, um, you know, some Pearl Jam, and it's not going to be all that similar to each other. But then somebody 800 years from now, has that as their sole source of 20th, wow. 20th, 21st century music. Um, so th these poems are really much more, much more distantly related to each other. But at the same time, many of them are datable to a much earlier period. Uh, as I mentioned, alliteration is the main characteristic of Norse poetry. And one thing that we notice in several of these poems is that lines uh, don't alliterate. There's actually what look like bad lines. But if you go back to earlier runic inscriptions and look at the language a few centuries before, you can actually find a time period when uh, the words uh, hadn't changed from an older form and the alliteration would actually work. So for example, today when somebody wants to um, imitate Shakespeare, right? they want to write a sonnet, they want to kind of make fun of, right. shall I compare thee to a summer's day or something? They often don't think about the fact that Shakespeare didn't rhyme the same words we do, right? For Shakespeare, prove and love rhymed. And so he writes those words in such a way that they'll, they'll end two successive lines uh, as, as rhymes. And so those rhymes actually help us see, oh, this actually is early. This actually is from Shakespeare's time because he's rhyming these words that a later uh, imitator wouldn't rhyme. And so similarly, alliteration in the poems helps to say, oh, there's alliteration here um, that works in the 900s, or in the case of two of the heroic poems in the 800s, uh, but not in the 1200s when it's actually being written down. And that gives us much better confidence that these poems actually do reflect a, a long oral tradition that are passed down uh, generation to generation from the period before 1000 when Iceland was converted to Christianity. And so uh, Snorri knew many of these poems too. And like I said, he quotes a lot of them. He quotes right about a third of Bolesbaugh. Um, he also seems to have known them. He either 
had a different manuscript where these poems were written down, or he knew them by heart, because occasionally his wording differs just a little bit, so we know he's not copying from the same manuscript of the Podogeta that we have. And that's kind of neat to think that there's at least two separate traditions there, right? There's the tradition that winds up in the manuscript of the Codex Regius of the Podogeta, and there's the tradition that winds up in Snorri's head somehow. So in the 1200s, people are still apparently reciting these poems. Um, and I compare that, you know, sometimes people, I think, take that uh, to heart as a sign that there's secret pagans in Iceland at the time. If anything, I think it actually suggests the opposite, because medieval Christianity was not very tolerant of uh, minority religions in its way. And I think what you're seeing is actually that people are so confident that their neighbors are not actually practicing this religion, that they don't feel like it's a uh, like it's a black mark on that person, right? I mean, if you think about the witchcraft crazes of uh, early modern Europe, I can't imagine what it would be like for a woman vaguely suspected of witchcraft to show an interest in, you know, even something as seemingly harmless as like yeah. Zeus and Aphrodite, stories about the Trojan War. Iceland is a small community then and now. And so, you know, crazy Uncle Snorri at the next farm, you know, he's always t telling me stories about Odin. It's probably not so much like, oh, let's burn the witch. It's more like, well, this is an antiquarian interest. A lot of people are interested in what our forefathers believed. And Snorri's prologue demonstrates that attitude, right? They believed in the wrong gods, but it wasn't their fault. They weren't evil for it. They just forgot the name of God. And uh, that tolerant attitude is probably why Iceland is where these things are written down and nowhere else. So now my question, though, is just touching this. When Christianity came to Iceland and, you know, spread all over Scandinavia, my question is, uh, during the Middle Ages, Christianity was very much, correct me if I'm wrong, at first, uh, a sort of the social club of the upper class. So would the general, like, agricultural population have been so quick to give up their religion that, you know, paganism, Norse paganism that they had embraced for hundreds and hundreds of years before Christianity came along? No, I don't think it was erased that fast. I, I think what changes fast is what God you pray to, right? So if you look at the way that they talk about missionary activity in the sagas, the, the missionaries aren't even saying your gods don't exist. They're saying our God is more powerful. And and so really what you're trying to do is, is you're trying to get the powerful people in the population to formally convert to Christianity. They browbeat the lower people into praying to a different God. You know, that, that's what's punished originally, not not what stories you tell, because how do you police that with, you know, 10 priests to start with in Norway? It's, you know, trying to convince people that no, what you need to be doing is not praying to Thor to save you at sea. You need to be praying to Christ. That's a more powerful option. That's, that's, that's better. But people are still telling these stories. And in fact, you, you see even early Christian kings in Norway, such as Olaf or Tryggvason, um, and, and to a certain extent, but even later, Olaf or Haraldsson, uh, encounter the pagan gods they're not they're not absent they're not figments of people's imagination they're just the enemy they're on the side of devils they're they're powerful uh, you know supernatural beings but they're just not god with a capital g and so you know without widespread literacy in latin the language of the church um people's encounter with christian doctrine is mostly going to be limited to the homily in their own language is going to be given by the priest on Sunday. And that's really not a huge amount. And it's mostly going to emphasize not disobeying church law about this, that, or the other. People going home and just telling a pretty harmless story about, you know, how about that time Thor went and fought Gerard there and he had to swim through a river of urine. You know, people laugh about it, but they don't, they're not worshiping these gods anymore. And I, I would compare that very very closely to the situation of Greek myth uh, today, right? A parent might sit down with their child and read, yeah. you know, the little book of Hercules or something with a few fun, entertaining stories, how Hercules cleaned the stables or how he slew the Hydra. But at the end of the day, the parent closes the book, you know, maybe it's Saturday night, the next Sunday, they're still going to church and nobody at church regards it as weird that the parent would tell a story about Hercules. There's nobody in the culture around them that worships Hercules. So there's no threat to the actual religious practice. And notice that in the Eddas, there is nothing about actual religion. It's just stories. Um, we don't know how to worship Thor. We don't know how to make a sacrifice to Odin. 
We don't know what to pray. We don't know what the festival calendar is. We actually don't know how to be good Norse pagans. We just have stories about their gods. And that's exactly what you'd expect if it's being transmitted by Christians. Yeah, that's a really interesting concept because, you know, you're you're dead on with that. Is um, there there we really don't know how to uh, uh, make a sacrifice to Odin or um, I know you had a video as to like I forget the exact title, but it was I remember watching it. It was something like how like do we know how the Vikings worshipped their gods? Essentially, did they make sacrifices? Did they make human sacrifices? Did they do all sorts of weird dances around a gigantic bonfire or something like that? You know. Oh yeah, that's that's my video, historical worship of the Norse gods. But all of that is just hints. Um, we have some outside observers, uh, the most famous being Adam of Bremen, uh, who talk about what they have heard from somebody else a Norse temple is like. And then we have stories in the sagas about celebrating some holidays like Yule or Yule. Uh, and we have some accounts of, of sacrifice and worship in the sagas. But None of that stuff is on a really secure footing. Uh, for example, unlike the poems of the Poetic Edda, where you actually have poetry, which is controlled language, and you have to, you know, at least you have to at least keep the meter. You have to keep at least most of the lines alliterating correctly. You know, just prose traditions about how people worshipped. Uh, there's no control on the language. There's no reason why, you know, somebody in the 1200s can't just make this up and say, well. I imagine that pagans worship like this because this is kind of like Christian worship, but it's just more rock and roll because it includes blood. Um, or another thing you have to consider is that the people writing this down are classically educated, at least to some extent. So they've read Greek and Roman books where they've read about pagans and they might just say, oh, this is how pagans worship. And so our accounts of Norse temples and the sagas may be irredeemably corrupted by the ideas that these saga writers had about just quote unquote how pagans worship because they think of all paganism as being the same thing, which is a common medieval belief too. Yeah, sort of like um, the generalization that the Romans might have had uh, over them as as being you know barbarians, simply non non Greeks or, or non Romans, right? Yeah, and and also somewhat similar to the way the Romans look at all other pantheons of gods as just expressions of their own, except the medieval Christian attitude is more like all these other pantheons of gods are just versions of the Greco Roman gods. So if you read, um, you know, we have so little about the, the old gods in Old English, but we do have some homilies uh, where the priest will say, um, you know, something like Zeus or Jupiter or as the vulgar people call him Thor. Right. Just uh, just understanding any set of pagan gods as being the same set of wrong yeah. gods. That's fascinating. Because they don't yeah, really uh, care. It, was it was it the Romans who likened the god Tyr to their own god of war, Mars? Well, uh, the one Roman who writes about this halfway clearly, uh, Tacitus, in his work Germania, uh, does mention worship of some gods, and he occasionally gives the Germanic name, like he mentions Nerthus, who is a goddess, but whose name is identical to Norther in the later language Old Norse, so that's interesting. Something happened in a thousand years. Um, I, I think that may be his sister that's never named, but who knows. Uh, but sometimes he also says, uh, for example, there's worship of Mercury among this tribe, and we have to just kind of infer that that's Odin based on some of the characteristics he mentions and based on the way that the uh, weekdays are renamed in Germanic languages like English for the Germanic gods uh, that are roughly equivalent to the Roman gods uh, who are in the names of the equivalent days of the week. So we took the day of Mars and made it the day of Tew, which is the English name of Tew. We took the day of Mercury, made that the day of Woden, which is the English form of Odin. Took the day of uh, Jupiter, made that the day of Thunor, the English form of Thor. And we took the day of Venus and made that the day of uh, Freya, which is the English form of Frigg. Yeah. And then Saturday, every language is something different with. Uh, so there, there may have been an understanding like that. And we do find, I, I should add to... Um, there were Germanic mercenaries in the Roman army, and they left us some inscriptions at Roman bases where they were stationed that address their gods in Latin as Roman gods, which is which presents a puzzle. So, for example, we find inscriptions that are addressed to Mars Thingsus. So Mars is, of course, the god of war, but then Thing, that's the Germanic word, 
or an assembly, right? Like we see in the, the law court of old, of old Iceland. And of course, it just becomes the English word thing. Uh, so who is the, who is the Mars of the assembly? You know, is this, are they addressing Tyr in some capacity? Uh, because Tyr is equated with Mars in the days of the week, or is this some other God? It's difficult to say. And this actually kind of ties into your question, if I can make a segue about uh, whether these la- about these labels, right? Who's God of war? Who's God of thunder? Who's God of this? God of the sea? God of fertility, etc. And I, I personally find these labels nearly useless. And I've become more, I don't know, aggressive toward toward those terms. Uh, actually, since I even since I published my translation of the Poetic Edda, or, or since it was published in 2015, uh, I think that these these labels actually are unhelpful. Because the Norse gods are not really roles, they're personalities. Uh, so we so often call Thor the god of thunder. But I can't think of a single myth where he does something with thunder. Um, you know, we call Njordr the god of the sea, but he's barely associated with the sea and the stories we actually have of him. We have one poem about how he wants to live by the ocean, but his wife Skadi wants to live in the mountains. And that's basically our story about Northern and the sea. Otherwise, he's a personality, not a role. And so I think trying to say, you know, who's the god of war? That This is a question I could ask, right? Who is the god of war? Well, all the gods fight a lot. <laughs> I don't know. Thor certainly goes to war all the time against the giants. Odin is always encouraging war among human beings because he wants uh, the good ones to die and go to Valhul to be part of his army. Uh, Tyr's name is used as an equivalent to uh, Mars in uh, in the days of the week. So maybe he also has an old rule related to war. But fundamentally, I think the answer is, isn't a quote unquote God of war. The gods are a, a cast, right? They're uh, a dramatis personae rather than, um, you know, rather than jobs that clock into. I, I don't think that that it really even makes sense to call to do something as simple as call Thor the god of thunder, even though his name means thunder. Thor is more, he's a protector. Um, he's a, he's, he's a, a warrior. Certainly he is a personification of the virtues of sort of middle of the road, middle-class Norse society, but he's not fundamentally an agent of thunder. Just as no God is fundamentally an agent of sea or fertility or, or even war. They are all, yeah, they're they're wow. pretty, they're pretty that's, complete. That's so interesting. Now, um, just so that I'm respectful to your time, uh, may I ask you one last question? Yeah. Um. So, one thing that I've wondered while uh, while reading the Norse myths is, you know, there's there's many different kinds of creatures in in Norse mythology, right? We have um, giants. Um, you know, there's um, of course the Svartalheim, the realm of the dwarves, and then the the realm of the elves, and then of course we have uh, humans, and then we have gods and goddesses. But uh, in Norse mythology, what sort of species are the giants? Are are they these you know monstrous um, nine foot tall creatures as we might understand them today? Or or what's what are the is there any care like is there any systematic differences between a god or goddess and and a giant? And, and is there any cases where you know, when, when a giant might marry a god, uh, that giant or giantess, I should say, would become a goddess then. You know, you know what is the sort of, um, I don't even know how to phrase the final question, but you know what I mean? Like, what are the, yeah, the giants in North I, I do. I, I, I see where you're going with it. And I've liked all your questions because these are all things I harp on. Uh, but... You know, I guess to, to begin with, there's really not a strong Mendelian genetics to Norse mythology. I mean, cons- you know, so species is a little bit of a hard term to use. Uh, consider that Loki and the giant woman, Angerboda, have three kids. One is a wolf, one is a giant snake, and one is a woman who's probably half corpse. And it's not that both of them have recessive genes for wolf, right? Genetics is a little, uh, I mean... It's almost more symbolic than functional. But, you know, the gods and the giants are members of one broader extended family. Uh, I would say, although it's never quite close, with some of the earliest characters in the mythology, it's very difficult to put a label on them, of god or giant or whatever. But looking at 
who is said to be Odin's ancestors, I put him at being three quarters giant. Uh, only his dad is not, you know, at least potentially identifiable as a quote unquote giant or Jotun is really a better term, but we, we say giant so much in English. Um, and then consider that if you read the poem Hymiskriva and the poetic Edda, both of Tyr's parents are giants. Uh, Hymir, the, the giantess's father, and then his unnamed mother is a giant too. And yet he is somehow considered one of the Asir, one of the, the dominant family of gods. And then Thor's mother is a giant too. Uh, and then uh, Vidar, the avenger of Odin on Fenrir, is the son of a giant. Thor has sons with giants. His sons, Mothi and Magni, who will survive Ragnarok and inherit Mjolnir in the, in the next world, are sons of Thor and giant women, not of Thor and his wife, Sue. So the gods are all at least part giant and sometimes all giant in ancestry. And then they end up uh, having sexual relations with giants, uh, both in and out of marriage. Now, in, in this society, as in many others, um, marriage is as much about status as anything else. So men are supposed to marry e either even status or a little bit down in status whereas women are supposed to marry about even or a little bit up. And so it's interesting to note that we do not see situations where giants are married, giant men are married to goddesses. But we do see the reverse. And in fact, it's notable that none of the Asir gods marry giantesses, but the Vanir gods do. And so what this suggests is that in status, the Asir are highest, the Vanir are a little below, and then the uh, giants are the bottom. Um, you know, notice that none of the Vanir gods, uh, Njordr and Freyr, they both take uh, their brides from giants. Njordr marries Skabi and Freyr marries uh, Gerdr. So they're all related very closely, uh, although there's clear status distinctions. It's somehow worse to be one of the giants. Um, but that probably reflects a little bit the tripartite status uh, divisions that we read about in human society in a poem like Rigsula, where Heimdall our fathers the different human being classes. We see the slaves or, or peasants and then the middle class and then the nobles. So this sense of there being also a tripartite uh, division of social classes in the supernatural world is not, it's, it's no surprise that North society would generate that. And, you know, the fact that the gods are ultimately going to fight the giants strikes me as more the end of many centuries or millennia of a family alternately making peace among themselves or some of them making peace among themselves and alternately fighting. It's sort of the long conclusion of that where everybody picks a side. And some of the characters, you, if it weren't for Volspa and its prophecy of Ragnarok, it might be a little bit hard to call which side they would come down on. Uh, consider Loki, who so often is basically just a funny sidekick to Thor. Um, you know, he's there with the giants, uh, breaking free out of his chains and leading these monsters, uh, like his children Fenrir and the Midgard Serpent against the gods, uh, who he is often with, who he often is very happily with. Uh, so I think it's sort of a, a, a family, uh, a family dynamic that when we ignore it, we also ignore how sophisticated in a way the Norse presentation of family trouble really is, right? We look at this, we see this in the sagas too, where the deepest tragedies, the biggest problems that come up in the sagas are always conflicts between people who are related to each other. And that's no different in the supernatural world. The giants look like the gods, they marry the gods, they are parents of gods, but they are somehow the wrong side of the tracks. That's that's absolutely incredible, and I, I never thought about that uh, that way in terms of um, you know the Vanir uh, family of gods perhaps being superior to that of the Asir, and uh, that if you know just as well the other way around the other way around the, the Vanir being a little inferior to the Asir. Yeah, yeah. The, sorry, yeah, the Asir being superior. Dr. Jackson Crawford, I have thoroughly 
thoroughly enjoyed this discussion and I've really uh, learned a lot and I've just absolutely enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed talking to you. If you enjoyed this episode of the History of Vikings, do me a favor and write me a review. You can also feel free to contact me. My email address is noah at thehistoryofvikings.com. Thanks so much for listening to the History of Vikings.